Hi, and welcome to VSU Today, your source for news and information at Virginia State University. I'm your host, Daphne Maxwell-Reed. In our first segment, we profile Curtis Moody, a Virginia farmer who has completed his Urban Agriculture Certification Program at VSU as a part of Virginia Cooperative Extension. As a result of participating in that program, Mr. Moody is giving back to his community in a meaningful way. Well, I'm an alumnus of Virginia State. I have a degree, my, my background is agriculture, plant and soil science. And I grew up on a farm. At Virginia State is in the family, so my father went to Virginia State, all my siblings went to Virginia State. So I just took what I already knew and put it into my education. The procedure is take this wet soil, weigh it, put in the oven. I went back and took some classes a few years ago. Mr. Carlos Monde is one of the students who came uh, for the first class uh, in the spring. Uh, he learned about soil management. When we talk about soil, what are we talking about? Crop management. Most of the soil come from some type of rocks. This is a best control of uh, you know, various uh, vegetables. Roots, we take water from the soil, through the stem, through the leaves. He learn about uh, entrepreneurship so that when he is equipped that way, he's not only going to do it in a better way, but he's going to teach other people to do it in a better way. So it's more like a train the trainer program. How's it going? Yeah. Thanks right. for coming out to uh, check out my guy, Dr. Katenji. Uh, Dr. Katenji is, uh, I call him my mentor in the program. My issue is we have a lot of suckers that grow. When I grow regular corn, I don't have these many suckers. I can call him at any time, ask him any question about the vegetables. He's a small garden farm specialist. So I can ask him any question about the vegetables and he'll answer right on the spot. Turnip greens came up uh -huh. and it caused the watermelon to I do a funny thing. I don't even know what this is. I don't even. And he comes down. He looks at my garden, and you know, I ask him about diseases. I had a few problems with some of my squash and my uh, uh, zucchini. Let me show you what I was talking about with this zucchini here. I can show you an example. And uh, he answered it right away. Really take it out. Yeah. Discard it completely. Don't even use it for, for yeah. compost. Right. I did. You know, took the tips that he 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 told me, and I implemented them and took care of the problem. The microbes that are in the soil okay. tend to take up the little nitrogen that is there. Ah, uh, okay. So, so it's, it's very good to have Dr. Kapenji around to, to be able to contact him and, and get information when I do have a problem. To stay up to speed, to stay profitable, to keep things rolling, we always are looking for new ideas, new concepts that can move the uh, needle forward or the frontier forward for many of you. Curtis Moon, yeah. you're located where? Uh, Newport News. The Urban Ag Certification Program uh, is a, it's a about a nine, ten week program. Uh, it's conducted on Saturdays where there is the morning portion is primary classroom instruction. We do like a class here, then do some activity outside. The afternoon portion is primarily hands-on experiential learning field trips. The hands-on, is, it's going to be based on some of the aspects that we learned in class about the soil. Are things that actually allow the participants to get engaged in what they're discussing, whether it's about taking soil samples. A soil test is a, a sampling of the soil and then taking it for, to the lab for assessment. Whether it's about planting plants. Organic matter is also your good friend. Whether it's yeah. about so, uh, actually learning management skills and practices associated with animal husbandry. I have a question. When you when you get the, the heavy metals, yeah. um, can you just go over how to read the, the sheet a little bit 
And what is of, of uh, interest is watching the new, I call him the new like farmer. The, the new farmer may have completed a 20-year career in something else. It may be engineering, it may be teaching, who knows? But they're now interested in food production. About 100 of these. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. This is just a demo. <laughs> Individuals like uh, uh, Mr. Curtis Munde, uh, they have operations out there. Like, uh, you know, he has a, an urban garden out there. And those are the folks that we are actually interested in reaching because they are not only practicing uh, gardening, but they are training other people. I found that I wanted to be more hands-on um, and grow a garden and work with the children. Yeah! yeah even okay. though we're teaching the adults how to grow, um, I wanted to teach classes for the children. What are you growing in your garden at home? Corn. Great. So over the past couple of years, Mr. Booty has been able to establish a positive relationship with our kids. And milk comes from cows, and cows eat corn. So we need the vegetables to feed the cows, right? When they see Mr. Moody out here in the garden, they don't hesitate to come over and work alongside him. Follow me, and we're gonna see some tomatoes. Some tomatoes. Uh, Mr. Moody has been in several classes like to talk tomatoes. about gardening and planting yes. with the classes. The teachers will bring the students out here in the garden and he works with them. Uh, Mr. Moody also set up an aquaponics in our school where he worked with two of our kindergarten classes and how to oversee that whole project as well. Um, we've done some classes for our parents, but I know that he's inspiring to do additional gardening classes with the families and the community. STEM is huge, and I add the A for agriculture, STEAM. It's using agriculture to teach about science, technology, engineering, and math is really something that sticks for students. So you have producers like Curtis Moody. Now, look down in there, and what do you see? who is producing food, but he's also working with helping schools establish gardens, school gardens. What kind of vegetables did you see in the garden? Um, Even though they're small children at this school, four and five year olds, they, they grasp it and they understand. Now when I ask them, um, the children that were here last year, I go by their classroom and I ask them, so what do plants need to grow? They go through the whole list. Uh, water, plants, sun, fertilizer, we need to pay attention and we need to spend some time. And the last thing they say is, the plants need love, and they come and give me a hug too. So it's very good working with the young children. We know that there's a growing interest and a growing number of individuals who are engaging themselves in agricultural enterprise who are not residing in rural areas. I use horse manure. Oh, this horse manure? Yeah, this is organic horse manure that I use. Us being able to touch lives and see the lives that we touch, that's what we're here to do. We're about hands-on. Now, when it rained, now, if it, if, when I started watering it, the support from Virginia State has been excellent for me. Anytime I have a problem, anytime I need to, even when I don't have a problem, I can just go down to the farm and they have, you know, they have gardens out there and I can go out in the garden and discuss things with the, 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 the professors and the garden, the people, the garden maintenance people and they'll help me right there. They're always hands-on and they're always willing to help. So it's been excellent for me. We transform lives by sharing knowledge, ideas that flourish, by encouraging creativity with the students that come here. We transform lives by shaping your future through scholarship, by way of study with the finest minds in the world. We transform lives from first-generation students to lifelong learners. We are the best place to be in Virginia to study, work, make an impact on your community. Virginia State University, we are your transformative experience. Welcome back. At Virginia State University, the doctoral program in health psychology specializes in both clinical health and behavioral and community health sciences. The clinical health program prepares students to work in applied settings, such as hospitals, physical rehabilitation centers, outpatient clinics, and other health services settings as members of multidisciplinary teams. Here's how you can earn a doctoral degree in clinical health psychology. Step three is goal development. You will hear this 
uh, labels, setting outcome goals. The clinical health PhD program is part of the health psychology PhD program. This is when we get into the strategy that we're going to use. So it's one of two tracks and the goal of the program is to prepare students to practice as clinical psychologists but also with a health psychology background. So when I think about problem selection, that first part we talked about, we put in high stress job. That was one of the things that came out during our brainstorming, right? The so, clinical health science track is one of those programs that takes five years to complete and it generally has to be accredited by an external body. Are you gonna work with the depressed mood first? People who graduate from this program, they can treat the entire person. So it's not just mental health, but it's physical health also. Most of our students complete, and in, in, in the history of our program, they've completed them generally on schedule. Because we know with depression, people tend to become withdrawn. That includes coursework, the dissertation, and a pre-doctoral internship. So we'll walk over to the library and um, maybe we'll see some of the staff over in the Academic Center for Excellence. Right now, I'm completing my, um, my first year. I did my practicum at the Counseling Center here at um, the university with Dr. Pugh. So Shauna, is a doctoral student from the Health Psychology PhD program and as part of that program they are required to complete a 200 hour practicum. So I want you to pay attention to how students are responding to you. You know, so Sean is completing her practicum within the University Counseling Center and I provide the supervision for Shauna. I give her cases, I monitor you know, all of her clinical work and basically I'm providing a training opportunity for her. Dr. Peoples? Yes. Hi. Hi. I want to introduce Hi. you to Shauna John Finn. She's one of the doctoral students. And students really look forward to the internship because it's a one year training program, typically away from school, and they actually get to function as a psychologist, not quite independent because they still have supervision, but they really feel like they're working in their field and doing what they came to school to do. So I overall I had a great experience. I feel now that I'm ready to go into the field and have a practicum at an institution in the community. As you know, I'm the advisor for the clinical health psychology program, so I'll meet with you every semester. Dr. Walker is our clinical director. Uh, her, her focus is primarily on early childhood, developmental issues, and family dynamics and she coordinates, in many cases, uh, assigning and uh, placing students in the various agencies through their, while they are training. Dr. Hill is our stats person, so you can see here they're working on a logic model. For application, we like our students to have at least 15 hours in psychology. People also have research advisors. And we do have some specific requirements, like they must have an undergraduate abnormal psychology class. Anybody see any problems there you want to throw out? As well as a physiological class, and we like to see some research background. A couple of things I'll point out. Given that this is a PhD program, students will be intensively involved in research. During the assessment class and your practicum, students also have to take the GRE, which most don't like, but the GRE is a requirement as well as your GPA. We will look at your GPA and we typically favor 3.0 and higher. The realistic piece comes in, I would say, with the severity, the type of diagnosis, and their pre-morbid functioning. First and foremost, I chose the doctoral program here at Virginia State University because I did decide to do my master's here. And from my experience going navigating through the master's program, I was really pleased with my professors, with the curriculum, and just what I was being given that I felt like I wanted to invest in the doctoral program for myself, but then also I knew they would be invested in me. You know, for this case, it sounds like coping one of the things we let our students know right off the bat is this is not like undergrad anymore. There's no straight lecturing from us. So this is the, um, the observation room. It's very interactive. It's hands-on. We'll observe you while you're uh, administering the test. From the beginning, from the very first semester, students start to practice administering those psychological assessments. And you will complete your testing. Um, your administrations here with volunteers 
and your faculty member observes you on the other side. So they also practice conducting intake interviews, clinical intake interviews, which provide that information we need for the treatment plan. You can't see us, but we can see you, so that allows us to get the information we need. And students are actually observed by us. It can be pretty intimidating, but um, we do have facilities with the one-way mirror, and we can observe students and provide feedback on how well they're providing the services. So as far as the treatment planning, um, when we do like the long-term goals and the short-term goals that go along with the long-term goals. For me, it was very important to get that HBCU experience. Although I felt that um, my teachers and um, my peers cared about me. Long-term goal is matching up with the problem. Um, now I'm kind of getting more of a cultural perspective and a cultural understanding of who I am and how that will display when I go into the work world. So it's not only that compassion and that real true understanding of where I come from and who I am as an individual, but it's more of an understanding of where we are now and where I want to go and how they can support me in getting to where I want to go. And I think that's something that's pretty unique to Virginia State University. They're very tailored to what we need as individuals. They're very personalized for us being that the doctoral program has fewer students in the undergraduate program. So they know me on a personal basis and they know what I need and what my strengths and weaknesses may be and how to work on those weaknesses and build on those strengths. In our next segment, we debut School of Thought a new platform that gives professors and people connected to our university an opportunity to discuss important topics of the day. Dr. Oliver Hill takes a moment as a cognitive scientist to talk about consciousness, a subject very dear to his heart. The nature of consciousness. Disciplines like religion and philosophy get to ask the big why questions. Why do we exist? Why is there something rather than nothing? What is real? Usually science asks questions on a much smaller scale, but as a cognitive scientist, I also get to ask questions about one of the big mysteries of the universe. Like how does the brain give rise to consciousness? The brain is a miraculous organ in its own right billions of neurons or nerve cells, each one of which can have thousands of synaptic connections to other cells. So trillions of circuits, like a supercomputer, but more wondrous than any computer that's been developed up to this point. For example, up to now, it's the only computer that gives rise to self-awareness. And what's really miraculous about our experience is that we can't experience the outside world directly. Our brain takes in information through the senses and organizes and interprets that information in order to give rise to our conscious experience. But the problem is, most of that data that comes into the brain is ambiguous. So it has to be interpreted in order to give it meaning. And this interpretation is based on things like our previous experience, our belief system, our prejudices, our biases. So in many ways, we all have our own unique view of reality, shaped by our own unique experiences and belief systems. For example, this is one of the reasons why research has shown that we have much better recognition for faces of members of our own race and gender because we have more practice with those of our own gender, of our own race. Research also shows that our biases and prejudices can distort memory, which is why eyewitness testimony is so unreliable. So because we have this unique view of reality that's different from anyone else, our own private reality, we can often misinterpret what we're experiencing. And this can give rise to misperceptions or illusions. And this happens much more often than you might expect. In fact, our mechanisms of perception are set up to make it more difficult to see things that contradict our beliefs. This is one reason why prejudices and biases of any kind are so difficult to eradicate.
Because we are experiencing the world through our own conceptual lens, our own conceptual prison, the science of consciousness, particularly as practiced by ancient traditions in the East, recommend that we actually study our conscious awareness. We can mindfully study the nature of our beliefs, the nature of our expectancies. We can do this through practices like self-reflection, meditation, and contemplation. And these ancient sciences of consciousness say that this can lead to a state of freedom where we can see beyond the limiting confines of our conceptual universe. If we can do these kinds of practices, one of the things that could happen is we might start to be able to understand one another better. And in these times where the world is so full of division and distrust and fear, this could perhaps allow people to understand one another better, both on a personal and a global scale. And it could bring about a more peaceful existence. During Labor Day weekend, Virginia State University's Trojan Explosion Marching Band took on the Norfolk State Marching Spartan Legion in their annual Labor Day Battle of the Bands program. It was an intense evening, to say the least, taking place in Norfolk, Virginia, with both sides claiming victory. Preparation for Battle of the Bands this year was something different, I think, for everybody. It get very intense, I think because of the fact that we want to outdo each other. We want to be the best in what we do. Even for the veterans, this was different because although we did it last year, it wasn't to the same Two, capacity because three, four, now we do, we're doing the football game as well. Last year we had a whole lot of energy and we didn't have to do a, a halftime show last year. This year we had to do a halftime show plus the battle. One, two, one, two, three. The battle of the is, is extremely intense because number one, the rivalry, the rivalry between the two schools. Um, but then it's our first performance of the year. That volume should have been three times that. One more time, go from the whistle. The we prepared for Norfolk State um, over the course of about three weeks. But actually on the field, probably about two and a half weeks. And in that two and a half weeks, I'm sure that we actually went through it five to 600 times easily, if not more. We're going to hold 64 count. Do not stop marching before 64. Can you angle in on Mathenas? The first step of love come down, snap back home. It means everything to those students. It means everything to the band directors, the staff, and everything to come out on top. One, two, ready, A, B, S, U. No one wants to be the, the underdog when it comes to the band battles. We're going to tear North up, man. Oh, oh it's, definitely. It's, yeah, it's definitely. A great Look, battle, man. Best of all time. We walked into the gymnasium and all I saw was green and gold. You hear the Trojan fans going, woo! Moves were happening everywhere. Norfolk fans, the biggest boo that you ever heard in your life. Just boo, just, just, it's, it's bad. It get very intense. I think because of the fact that we want to outdo each other. We want to be the best in what we do. Our legacy is at stake. It's more than just going out there and performing for the crowd. Each man is really trying to uphold a legacy. Either you perform now or never. What we're trying to, to accomplish is to the, the greatness of, of what we do, uh, and that is uh, to have a, a, producing a great show to entertain the people. 
In the Battle of the Bands, what we have is a specified program that each of the sections will do certain things, but we also have certain music selections that come in order. It's a battle of who can chant the hardest, who can, who can stand still the hardest. So intensity is, is in the air, it's in our blood, it's, just, it's in the way we stand, the way we hold our horns, the way we play. The first sectional fanfare was the trumpet. The trumpets, they came out to do the skit, and the skit was the trumpet player had on a Norfolk State shirt, and he played a traditional Norfolk State trumpet fanfare. And he played a fanfare really bad, and he did it to kind of taunt them. And the rest of the members from our trumpet section came up to him like, yo, what are you doing? Even the band played along like, yo, you know, what's going on? What are you doing? You got a Norfolk shirt on, you're playing their fanfare. And then he threw the shirt at the Norfolk State um, band. They retaliated. They threw the shirt back at us twice. We, we discuss some things before we do it, before it happens. And some things we, we want it to happen. We all, we have it under the control. Most people think we don't have it under control. There's a line that we don't cross. And we make sure that the students don't cross that particular line because it can cause some problems. Norfolk State is a tough crowd, but I think that they respect a good performance. And we teach musicianship first. And because of that, I believe that they do respect, regardless if they're gonna say we were the better band, they really respect our musicianship and the performance that we gave. At Virginia State, our sousaphone section is called Horsepower, and it's probably the most popular sousaphone section in all HBCUs. I think we have a unique group, and what you heard from Norfolk State is that they're imitating Virginia State. Virginia State had nine sousaphones, and Norfolk State had 16. I just think they got a big band. I think if we had the size they had, it'd be unfair. On a scale of 10, I think we, we did about 10. Norfolk State did about five. We beat them on Friday night, the band. The band beat them Saturday night. Our football team beat Norfolk State's Division I football team of the MEAC 14 to 10. We beat them like always, regardless of the size, we beat them again. The bigger band and their Division I school were Division II CIAA and a smaller band. I, I, I think they underestimated us. I don't think they came prepared. But at the end of the day, it's all family. You know, we got plenty of friends in Norfolk State's band. You know, it's, it's all one love. I can't wait till next year. Well, that does it for this edition of VSU Today. I'm your host, Daphne Maxwell-Reed. For more information on Virginia State University, please visit our website at vsu.edu or visit VSU Today on Facebook for a rebroadcast of our program. See you next time.